Aloha, happy Friday. I'm Kaui Lucas, and this is Hawaii is my mainland. Every Friday at 3 p.m. right here on Think Tech. This week, I have a, a guest from the world of theater, although he's probably at least as well known in the world of law. And in this case, the theater piece was about law practice. My guest is local attorney Ron Heller, who made a spectacular directorial debut um, recently at Tag Theater with Disgraced, the uh, 2013 Pulitzer Prize winning play by Ayad Akhtar. Welcome, Ron. Thank you. So um, I, I didn't do any homework before seeing mm -hmm. the show. Um, and so walked in and it's a nice, you know, uh, domestic kind of drama scene building and then Wow, it just exploded all over the place. And at the end of the show, the show had no intermission, right? How long was the show? Just under 90 minutes. Just under 90 minutes. And it was, it was a workout. <laughs> <laughs> it was an emotional workout being in the audience. It was like, oh, thank God I'm not married. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. But <laughs> it was really powerful. Okay. Um, so amazing job for your first time out of the gates uh, directing. But you've been involved in theater a long time. Yes, more than 40 years ago when I started uh, back in college. So w why directing all of a sudden at this point? It's just the next step for me. I've been doing a lot of acting. I've done almost everything else there is in theater, working backstage. I've done you know lights, costumes, sets, all those kinds of things. Uh, but directing was something I haven't done yet, and I wanted to try. So how did you, how did you go, how did this piece find you, or did you find this piece, or how did it happen that this really stunning work that's not a simple thing ended up being your, your, your first production? Well, the way it works at TAG is generally a director goes to the board at TAG and suggests a show, and I did that. It wasn't this show, actually. I suggested something else. And they said, well, we kind of like it, but it doesn't really fit into our season. And they asked me to read a couple other things. And I actually read another show or two first and just wasn't all that excited by those scripts. Uh, and then Brad Powell, the artistic director at TAG, said, have you looked at Disgraced? And I said, no, I haven't. But he, he said, well, go read it. And I did. And as soon as I read it, I said, yes, I've got to do this show. And why? It just grabbed me because it's such a powerful script. It's, it's well written, it's intense, it's very contemporary. I mean, it deals with the issues of being Muslim in America today, uh, which obviously is something that's, that's all over the headlines right now. So it's you know, very relevant. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning play. I mean, it's a well written script. It's a good piece of work to do. And so as soon as I read it, I was just hooked on it. Well, uh... I wasn't the only one that loved it. You got some excellent uh, reviews, which is, you know, not the main thing, but it's ni nice to have. Um, the Star Bulletin came out and, and talked about it, and I thought they did a, a pretty good, pretty good write-up um, about, um, you know, having some context about it, and if people were, you know, moved to motivate people to go and, and see it somehow. I don't know if it's available online, but you could at least get a copy of the script if someone wanted to read it, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can buy the script on Amazon or whatever. And did you say the, the playwright has, has written, a, that this was based on a book, or? N not really based on a book. He wrote a novel before this, um, and the novel was, was not really autobiographical, but kind of related to his own life in the sense of growing up in a Muslim family, although it was a secular Muslim family. Uh, and he kind of took some of that background from the novel and it ended up in the play. It, I mean, it's two different stories. It's not just taking okay. the novel and making yeah. it into a play. Uh, but a lot of the same concepts came up. A lot of the same ideas are dealt with. So let's, um, you've, you've edited out for me very nicely a little, a little clip from, from the show. Let's have a look at, at the video. And so the viewers have a sense of what we're talking about when we're talking about drama. <laughs> okay. Okay, Uncle, don't think of him as a Muslim if you don't. What? <laughs> Just think of him as a wise man who many people depend on. Yeah, I hear you, Louis. I really do. Okay, so come to the hearing next Thursday. 
Next Thursday is uh, a busy day at work. Uncle, an old man who didn't do anything wrong is sitting in prison and right now. And there's nothing I can do about it! Honey. The defendant, surrounded by a gauntlet of attorneys, struck a defiant tone. And then she quotes an attorney, me, implying that I'm one of the gauntlet of attorneys. She doesn't quote another attorney. But she says you're just supporting him. I don't see a just. There's no just supporting him. You know, I picked up the recipe on a Fulbright in Seville. Oh, I love Spain. <coughs> I ran with the bulls in Pamplona. You <laughs> did not run with the bulls. <laughs> I watched people run with the bulls. <laughs> it was thrilling. Let's talk about something that is in the text. Wife beating. Wife beating. Great, we the breath. Yeah, really? <laughs> So, the Angel Gabriel comes to Muhammad. Angel Gabriel? Uh, yeah, that's how Muslims believe the Quran came to humanity. The Angel Gabriel supposedly dictated to Muhammad word for word. Oh, like uh, Joseph Smith, Mormonism. They say that an angel named Marami came down in upstate New York mm -hmm. and spoke to Joseph Smith. Moroni, honey, not Marami. You sure? It was on South Park. Politics follows faith. No distinction between mosque and state. Remember all that? So, if the point is that the world in the Quran was a better place than this world, well, then, let's go back. Let's stone adulterers. Let's cut off the hands of thieves. Let's kill the unbelievers. Okay, I am so disgusted with myself. So that's um, that's so much material, so rich. Um, the what was it like to um, bring that diversity of really strong? I mean, how did you get the actors to to do what they did so beautifully? Well, first of all, I had a great group of people to work with, and I was really lucky to be able to find and assemble the cast that I had. <laughs> Tell us who played who. Okay, uh, Troy Apostle was Amir, Courtney Coston as Emily, uh, Victoria Brown Wilson as Jory, uh, Max Holtz as Isaac, and Noah Faalmina as Abe. Okay, and like I said, all of them were great. I was really lucky to assemble that group. Uh, we spent a lot of time at the beginning working with the text. Uh, before we even really started mapping out the moves on the stage and everything, we spent time just around the table reading the script and talking about what does it mean and where are these references coming from and what is he really talking about when he says this. And, you know, going into a lot of detail about some of the, the background. Uh, for example, there's a mention of the mosque at Cordoba. 
So we looked up the mosque at Cordoba and you know found pictures of it and looked at those and and you know researched what does it mean and why is it being used as a symbol in this particular case. And why which, is it? Well, in that particular case, that that mosque is actually a very famous mosque. It, it was for a long time the second largest mosque in the world, uh, and it's unique in that. On the same site, the same actual physical site, there are both a mosque and a cathedral. And for centuries, it was shared between the Catholics using the cathedral and the Muslims using the mosque. And so that cathedral is both a symbol of Christian-Muslim cooperation and unfortunately at present, a symbol of Christian-Muslim tension because right now the property is owned by the Diocese of Cordoba and they are not allowing the Muslims to use the mosque as, as an, you know, an active operating mosque. So now there's tension about it in terms of you know, the property being used by one religion but not the other. So that, that same mosque is both a symbol of when the two religions were coexisting and cooperating and a symbol of the tension that exists today. And it's, it's not an accident that the playwright picked that mosque to refer to. Yeah, clearly not. And and thanks for for giving that. Watching the watching the clips now, now that I know what happens later in the 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 play, it's the I want to go back and read it because there were so many lines that reverberate into to the action later on. The the sort of what seemed like a flippant remark about oh, let's talk about what's really in the Quran, wife beating, mm -hmm. you know, and then not knowing how that came in. I, I was sort of wondering if I if I could look around and and see people going through PTSD at that <laughs> at that moment in the in the theater. It was it was quite it was electric. Um, that was really really well done. They managed to um, create quite a bit of impact in that. Was that how was that for with the rehearsals and going through what must have been pretty well. Tough? It, it was intense in rehearsal too. I mean. I, I had friends who afterwards said that you know there were moments during the play when they felt almost like they wanted to look away. They couldn't watch it because it was it was so hard to watch. Uh, but that's part of what we were actually trying to do is is to make it that intense. Uh, and obviously, for example, the the moment when Amira attacks Emily, you know that that's a tough thing to watch. I I kind of flinch myself sometimes just looking at it. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's illustrating the whole point of the play, which is their inability to coexist peacefully, you know, and to, to understand each other and to actually work around or work through the differences that they have. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's one of the main themes in the play. That's what it's all about. So you have to confront that, but that doesn't necessarily make it easy to confront. Right. Um, did they, did you, the actors do any kind of, um... Uh, special studies ar around the the themes and and the culture. Well, they all did a lot of reading. Um, in fact, it, it surprised me to the extent that some of them actually went out and looked things up on their own and and did a lot of reading and studying. Uh, and then I tried to bring things in. You know, when we were doing all that table work at the beginning of rehearsal, uh, you know, we we talked about things like okay, when they're talking about the Quran in this scene, are they accurately saying what's really in the Quran, or are they distorting what's really in the Quran? And you know, we, we tried to be aware of those kinds of things as we were working our way through it. Did you have some sort of a local expert to refer to? Did you have anybody helping you out with the nuances of Islam? Uh, not with the nuances of Islam. I, I pretty much attempted to do that on my own. I mean, okay. I, I actually read the Quran, um, and <laughs> well, that's pretty going straight to the source. <laughs> right. uh, and I got some books on tape dealing with Islam and you know the background of Islamic architecture and Islamic art and all those kinds of things. Oh, well, let's uh, talk about how that uh, art and architecture fed into the story when we come back from a short break. Sure. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go! Oh, oh, oh. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. 
Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas. My guest today is Ron Heller, the director of Disgraced, which was recently um, uh, performed at the Tag Theater. Ron, tell us where the Tag Theater is um, for those unenlightened, poor, starving, <laughs> <laughs> culturally starving folks who haven't yet discovered it. It's in the Dole Cannery building, which is right across the street from the Dole Movie Theaters. Yeah, so ground level, right, right across from the theaters. If it's just on the Mackay side of that um, building, that's on the other side of Evil A Street. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a great little theater. Lots of parking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can park in the Costco <laughs> lot on the other side, so there's plenty of space. Yeah, free space. We like yeah. that. Or tag validates if you park in the, the movie parking structure. Oh, good to know. Okay. I admit that this was only the second production I've been to a tag, <laughs> but um, really a great space. A really great. It's intimate, but um, I don't know. What did you think for as a director? Well, I've done a number of shows with tag in the past, and, and you know, it's, it's a nice small theater, about 65 seats. Uh, so obviously not a huge space. Um, you can't get a big cast or a big show in there, but you can do a lot of good things. Yeah, so um, back to the, the theme of Disgraced and, and Prejudice. Well, what are the themes of Disgraced? And there's, um, there's a, it's so layered. In, it's, talk about the characters and their various juxtapositions with um, Prejudice. And we have a... a uh, Iranian, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Pakistani. Pakistani. Uh, Amir is Pakistani. He's an attorney and? And very focused on professional success. I mean, his, his goal is to become a partner in the law firm where he works. And his main focus, his, his central goal is professional success, to be recognized, to be respected, to be admired. I mean, he, he really needs the approval of other people. And he is so focused on his profession that, in fact, in, in the scene where Emily, his wife, is accused of having an affair with Isaac, and then Jory, who is the accuser, says, by the way, Mort, the senior partner in the law firm, is not returning your phone calls, is he? The first thing that Amir does is obsess about the fact that Mort's not re returning his phone calls. So he goes immediately to thinking about What's going on at the office, and how does it affect my prospects of making partner, and what does this mean in terms of the law firm and, and my prospects there? And after that, after thinking about all this stuff at work, then he turns to the question of, gee, is my wife actually having an affair? And I think that tells us a lot about his character, that the first thing that he worries about is not, is my wife having an affair? The first thing he worries about is, am I in trouble at the office? So she's, uh, his wife is, is also ambitious though, right? Yes, she's an artist and focused on Islamic art, which is another one of the big things in the show. Uh, you can see the Islamic tile pattern. That was a painting that we had on the set, uh, which by the way is, is based on real Islamic tile patterns. Uh, there is an exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London uh, that has hundreds of years worth of Islamic art and in particular there's there's one particular tile pattern from the 13th century that was the basis of that painting. Ah. It, it's not copied exactly but the shapes and the colors and everything are all based on real 13th century Islamic patterns. Okay and it, I was wondering was it was that uh, sort of uh, uh, Trompe-Loy, I don't know whether it's on, it, the, the, the distortion that makes it look mm -hmm. con, convex or concave, and um, is that supposed to look, is it on a dome or, or was that just 
It's supposed to look like a curving of the surface, and there's, okay. there's a reference in the show, a line that says it, it's tending toward the convex. Um, the, the way that was actually done is my wife, who did the painting. Yay, uh, Rachel. Yes. Good job. Yes, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a labor it's, of love. Look, at, we're talking about this. This is actually a, a, a painting here, and wow, that's a lot of detail. <laughs> it took a tremendous amount of effort, too. I mean, I, I know I saw her working on it every day. <laughs> uh, but she got that effect and then very meticulously painted in each and every one of those tiles and, you know, put in all the designs and so on. Okay, and in, in the show, um, Emily has, is an aspiring um, artist. Right, who has painted this painting. And there's a scene where she shows it to Isaac, who is a curator at the Whitney Museum. And he likes this painting and goes to see some of her other work and, and likes that too. Eventually decides to do a show at the Whitney featuring her among several other artists. And there's, there's a whole lot of discussion about that in the show. Um, and it's a big deal for her that you know, she's going to be in a show at the Whitney. I mean, that, that's a huge success for any artist. I mean, the, the Whitney is obviously a, you yes. know, a major thing. And, and to be in a show there means she's kind of made it, right? So it's, it's a big deal for her. But at the same time, the night that Isaac and Jory are coming over to basically tell her that she's going to be in the show, uh, Amir has had a bad day at the office. And that scene starts with Amir drinking alone uh, in a bad mood. And then Emily walks in, uh, reminds him that, that Isaac and Jory are coming over, which he had forgotten. I mean, this is a big deal for her. And he had forgotten it, right? And then the scene kind of develops from there. And that turns into the dinner party at which Amir and Isaac have a big confrontation. And then Jory kind of yells at him and stomps out. And, you know, everything goes downhill for him in that dinner. And that um, very vulnerable, tender moment he has, or tender in a sort of bleeding way, um, at the end, it was in that clip of um, him coming to terms with you know, what he really wanted, the, the, mm -hmm. that Emily was thinking highly of him and, and that he's lost all of, of that. That, I thought, was um, a very interesting moment in theater mm -hmm. because so often when we're dealing with subjects like prejudice or there's this, there's this desire to have the, you know, the sort of the noble savage, I'm sorry to just like gloss over it that way, but um, just to um, have them, the downtrodden person or the, the, the uh, uh, minority person um, n be more heroic. And what I thought was really interesting was that, that this play really got to that super vulnerable little core moment for him. Uh -huh. And for her. And for her. I mean, there, there are the no cultural. heroes. Right, right? okay. No, nobody it. in the show comes out as a real hero. Right? Everybody shows their flaws, shows their downside, so to speak. I mean, everybody has their good moments, but these, these are characters who are real, who are human. And that means they have good parts and bad parts. And we see that in, in each and every one of the characters at various times. Now, the scene you're talking about is, is kind of the final parting of Amir and Emily. And he, in that scene, says, I'm so sorry for what happened. You know, he, he knows he was wrong when he hit her. He knows, you know, he caused a lot of the problems in the relationship. But then she comes back and says, well, I had a part in what happened, too. You know, it's, it was partly my fault because... My work, my ambition, my concentration on my art, I was so focused on that that I didn't even realize what this was doing to you, right? And so she admits that, that she is also at fault. I thought that was another beautiful thing. Also unusual. We turn, tend to make these um, monochromatic heroes out of the victims. And again, that didn't happen here. She owned her, her part to it, which in no way excused what he did, but she was you know, able to say, okay, well, you know, I'm not holier than thou. And, um, well, I think that's one of the things that makes it such a good play is that the characters are very real. And real people are not all good or all bad. I mean, real people are a combination. 
everybody's got some good points and everybody's got some bad points, right? And, and we see that in the play. So uh, we haven't talked about the relationship um, of the young man, um, Amir's nephew. Um, can you talk about that? Because I thought that, um, especially sort of in the global, what we're dealing with globally, was a, a very interesting, skillful way to, um, to talk about that subject. Of sure. And I think what happens to Abe is, is a real commentary on what's going on socially and politically in our country. Because Abe starts out as kind of the typical college kid. I mean, he's, he's Muslim, but he's not really that actively religious. He's not that serious about it. He's, he's more of a, you know, typical, let's have fun kind of college guy. Wearing a t-shirt right. and, yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of guy who likes to go hang out with his friends and have a good time and, you know. And then by the end of the show, we get the sense that he's turning into something much more of a radical Islamic, you know, militant, I guess you could say. Uh, that he's taking on attitudes that, that we would view as, as almost dangerous. Uh, but we can see that he's been pushed there by the way he's been treated. It, it's not that he wanted to become that way. It's that the way he was treated in our country and, and the way he was treated by the legal system in particular, by the FBI, you know, has pushed him to fight back. And, you know, you, you can understand and, and almost not blame him for where he's going because the way he was treated is the reason for where he's going. That really was, the, I felt, the most important message in the whole thing, to finally um, to have a space where we're, we're already been tenderized by all of this <laughs> other stuff. But then to have that so poignantly pushed out, he did not want, he, he wanted to be a, a happy American teenager, but he was not allowed to be. Right. Oh, so in the just in the last um, few uh, uh, seconds here, Ron, um, what's next for you? Do you know? Well, in terms of directing, I don't know yet what's next. In terms of acting, I'm going to be working with the Hawaii Shakespeare Festival in their upcoming Chekhov play, The Seagull. Oh, and where, where is that going to be? Uh, the, the Arts at Mark's Garage. Uh, going to be in August. Uh, so we're just about to start rehearsal next week. Well, thank you so much for taking time from, from both your passion and your profession <laughs> to come down and talk here at ThinkTech. Aloha. Oh, aloha. Thanks for asking me.